Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Hey, and Happy New Year! I hope the year 2015 is going great for you so far. Personally, I'm pretty pumped about having a fresh new calendar to get everything started on again. And we are very excited to be back for this week's show, which features another special guest interview. And I think you're really going to enjoy this one. You can find the show notes at othersidepodcast.com slash 20. And if you have any questions or feedback for us, please don't hesitate to send us an email or reach us at our Twitter handle, which is Other Side Talk. All right, everybody. Uh, I am here with the author of Haunted Rock and Roll, Ghostly Tales of Musical Legends, Matthew Swain. Uh, I'm pronouncing your name right, right, Matthew? Am I okay there? Absolutely. You got it right. Okay. And uh, Matthew is joining us from State College, PA? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, so the book came out uh, this year, right, Matt? Yeah, it actually came out in the spring, like in March. And uh, what inspired you uh, to write a book about the ghost stories of rock stars? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I guess I always blame my mom because I was born on Halloween. Oh. So, it, yeah, that's where the ch- uh, the train jumped the tracks, I think, a little bit. But uh, I've always been interested in horror movies and ghost stories. And uh, I guess probably when I started working at a daily newspaper, I started collecting ghost stories, mainly about universities uh, and university ghost stories. And uh, back in uh, probably about three or four years ago, I published a book on that. So I was looking around for another project and I thought, well, you know, I love rock and roll and, um, these guys and gals that were rock stars live such interesting lives. I, I bet that they they have some great ghost stories. Uh, and so I did. I start. I, I remembered a few of the ghost stories about Elvis Presley and one or two about John Lennon. And I thought I'm going to research this and see if I could make a book out of it. You know, I have to tell you, I was guided a lot by Gary Patterson and oh, his books. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, he's a, a great author and. He kind of gave me this idea of, uh, not not him personally, but reading his books gave me this idea that rock and roll is very special uh, when it comes to spirituality. And that that sort of inspired me to look not just at the occult and the, the, you know, the occult legends of rock and roll, but also sort of like a paranormal history of ghost stories in rock and roll. And once I started researching it, it was probably one of the most fun projects I've ever had, uh, writing projects. I, I just found tons of stories, and they started from the beginning of the rock and roll era and continue even to this day. So, um, you know, when you, when you research a, a book like this, mm-hmm. you know, what was... You know, what did you start out with? Um, did, you know, like newspaper clippings or like from Cream Magazine or something like that or Rolling Stone? Like how did, um, how did you find even in some of these, some of the more, you know, even obscure ones and things like that? Like I think about the Black Sabbath one. Right. And I think that one, it's like, well, how did he even find out about that one in the first place? You know, uh, so one thing... First of all, I, I started as a journalist pre-web, so I'm... I remember how difficult it was to go through library after library trying to find track down references. So you actually you room, actually make phone calls when you do interviews. Right. Huh? Wow. Yeah, you had to make phone calls and actually talk to other human beings. But Scary. with the web, I would find little snippets and hints of these ghost stories, and then I would try to go to the original source, uh, books, magazines, newspapers, online archives, uh, blog posts, uh, anything like that. I was just really just trying to find, uh, it, it's almost like you find snippets and then you find a lot of dead ends too. You find a lot of stuff that is probably just people making jokes or, you know, making up stories. And although I'm a big believer in the idea that some of these ghost stories are what I call ghost lore, 
which is folklore based on ghosts and spirits, mm -hmm. I really feel like some of them just didn't pass the smell test enough to, to get into the book. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of relied on a lot of my, you know, journalistic background and reporting background and, and going from source to source. Some of the places I visited incidentally in my life, um, I went to Nashville and Memphis uh, and toured some of those buildings, not really to find ghosts, but really because I'm interested in rock music history and country music history. Absolutely. So uh, I, I'm not a, a paranormal investigator per se. Um, in fact, I just usually blame anything that goes wrong in the house on the paranormal. That's right. the, the extent of my paranormal investigative abilities. But <laughs> You know, from pulling all this up, the other thing that I've, I did different in this book, uh, I reached out to paranormal investigators and paranormal researchers who had some familiarity with those uh, places. So I would call them and get their, you know, sometimes I used it in the book, sometimes I didn't. But what I was trying to get at is with these books, there's a fine line between ghost lore and actual ghost accounts. So I kind of contact them to get me an idea of just whether these things are, they felt like they were uh, haunted or maybe this, these are just stories that people and fans spread around about their, their uh, heroes just to mm -hmm. keep them alive. So what was, um, when you say that some of the stories didn't pass the smell test, are there any mm -hmm. in particular, any kind of urban legends or ghost stories that you think uh, that are familiar to rock fans that when you actually investigated, you're like, no, nah, this is complete and utter. This is completely bogus. Anything? Just yeah. Well, I I did find you know the Janis Joplin sandwich story is is the classic one right. that she got on a choke eating on a ham sandwich. That's kind of a a story that that gets passed around. Uh, in fact, I I've probably corrected two or three people just in the recent past on on that one. As far as the ghost stories, I don't know, because um, the way I kind of approach the material is if these stories are passed around, I'll give you a classic one. Sure, uh, now sure. That I can remember. Yeah. The classic one is the uh, guy, a uh, truck driver is on his way to um, Memphis, mm -hmm. and he picks up a hitchhiker, and he gets him in the truck, and, it, and the guy tells him an address, and you know, Elvis Presley Lane or whatever. And as the truckers looking over at him, he, he realizes he looks like a young Elvis Presley and he kind of talks like Elvis. And then when he gets to the address, it's at the gates of Graceland and, you know, the young man jumps out of the truck and disappears into the gates. That's a classic ghost lore story. Uh, I think I may have added that in the um, book itself, even though I, I kind of think it's bull crap. In fact, I, you know, almost assured it's bull crap. <laughs> right. Uh, what what I think is important uh, these stories are that that they're passed around from fan to fan. Some believe them, some don't. But they're fun stories. But they're ways of reconnecting the fan with the person that they are, you know, quote unquote, worshiping. Right. So I think in the back of their minds, they're always thinking maybe they're going down the road and they can run into Elvis. I, it, as much as they're fanciful stories, I think they're kind of important. And that's why something like that might get into the uh, book. But on the other hand, I had a story that was really tantalizing. Um, mm. It was a story about Pete Townsend when he was playing, I think it might have been in a, in a gig in Ohio. It was an outdoor gig. He said he saw Keith Moon out in the audience, but... I never really found a first-hand account of him saying that. I didn't find any uh, reputable sources saying that that happened, or even that it was a common, you know, piece of ghost lore that was spread throughout the Who fan community. All I found was like a snippet on a message board, and I really wanted that to be true, and I wanted to write that story, but it just didn't happen. So there's sort of a gray area when I'm writing this, but um, that's kind of how I approach it. Well, you know, that, that, that Elvis hitchhiker story is great because that's, uh, um, you know, that, that ghostly hitchhiker that disappears, mm -hmm. you know, when you reach the destination. Um, Resurrection Cemetery in Chicago has one. 
Uh, that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's a famous one. And, um, Resurrection Mary, that's her name. I think I've got a, I think I've got a button with her on it. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, that's that's the kind of story that gets recycled in all different kinds of places. So it's great that you have one where it's like, you know what, we're gonna take this classic haunted hitchhiker and then we're gonna mm-hmm. put we're gonna put the king in there. Right. You know, and, and kinda have him be the, the young Elvis that everyone loves to remember. The the good son and uh the southern gentleman. You know, yep. and not peanut butter, banana sandwiches, gun tote, and shoot out the television, Elvis. That um, right, right. <laughs> that you think yeah, of. And it's that's interesting. You brought that up because what I find, and a lot of this is, it's kind of weird that I write books generally because I don't know a lot about it and I want to find out more. Uh, but what happens is, after I write the book, I start thinking about it, and you know, then I'll. I'll, I'll talk to folks like you and I'll start, you know, really kind of pouring into the material. And what you find about Elvis is, first of all, his ghost, if he's the king of rock and roll, he's the king of rock and roll ghost stories. Ah. His ghost appears everywhere, every location that he's pretty much been known for. So you'll find his ghost in Graceland. You'll find ghost stories in Ryman in Nashville. You'll find ghost stories uh, where he filmed Kid Creole in, in uh, New Orleans, you'll find kind of the Elvis, uh, the fat Elvis in Las Vegas ghost. Mm. So all across the country, yeah, at the Hilton, as a matter of fact, uh, you find ghost stories of of him and those eras that you know Elvis from. That's that's cool. That it's it's a it's a fun way that um, different kinds of Elvises in different places, you right? Know, just like just like you you remember Amer- uh, I if this was twenty years ago now I don't remember, but um, remember when they had the Elvis stamp? Yes. And you can yep. you can vote on like which era of Elvis that you wanted to have the stamp, and that, and that kind of that kind of makes me think about that. And what other character in American life have we had so many different? You know, eras of, and he's meant different things to different people at, uh, in, you know, in different generations, in different decades. Yeah, and and each each generation kind of goes to that era of Elvis. Um, you know, if you if you found Elvis in the seventies, you probably gravitate to the Vegas Elvis. If you, you know, you have the hillbilly cat era that I really like in Sun Records. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there there are other eras, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you see it to a certain extent with the Beatles, where they have the the Fab Four, the Mop Tops, and then they have the kind of Sgt. Pepper era, and then you kind of have the White Album era. But but nothing like Elvis. He is, you know, I don't use iconic often, uh, but he definitely is iconic in a lot of ways. Well, you know, and that's that's a funny way to you know that you said that too, because when I think of Elvis. Before I even think of the young Elvis and stuff, I <clears throat> the first record I heard I think was Aloha from Hawaii, and we had that. It was, a, yeah. it was like a blue, it was a blue LP, and I remember yep. you know putting that on the record player as a little kid. So when I think of Elvis, I think of that, you know, I think of Hawaii Elvis, and while other yeah. people might think of Ed Sullivan, or other people might think of the Comeback Special, or like it's Jailhouse Rock, um, we all have our different Elvis at a different age, right. Right, and, and and so when you're working on these ghost stories, uh, it, you know, as I said, when I was writing the book, it it didn't even occur to me. But then later, I thought, you know, there's almost every single Elvis era has an Elvis ghost story. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, when I was looking through the book, when we're you know, if we're still in the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the, in the 50s here. And we're thinking about the classic era of rock and roll. Uh, looking mm-hmm. through the book, I was excited that you talked about the Rave and Eagles Club in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, because that's where I grew up. And so those were all the, all the original shows that I went to. Uh, were okay. At the, the Rave and the Eagles Club. And to say that, um, you know, that they can have the spirit of Buddy Holly might right. be there. Um, yeah, and I, you know, as I was run, uh, writing that, uh, and I didn't, I didn't visit those clubs, and I didn't get a chance to talk to any paranormal investigators in that place. I think I did 
uh, have email communications with one, but um, the thing that I didn't put in that I'm pretty sure is correct, but I, I couldn't verify was uh, in the Rave Eagles, it's very much a, he appears to musicians, um, not just, Ooh. you know, the kind of common rabble. That's the way <laughs> the story seems to circulate, which it makes it really even cooler that he's a, uh, he's almost like a, you know, when you, when you, when you research these stories, you start to come along, uh, you know, the Joseph Campbell mythology, the Carl Jung mythology, all of that mm-hmm. starts to pop up because he's almost like in some, in some ways a guardian spirit, uh, for these musicians. Oh, I can see that with Buddy Hollick as a trendsetter, you know, oh, yeah. in, in rock and roll and the combination of, uh, you know the country music style and rock and roll music style and and everything and the and he was one of the first to go, uh, right? You know, and so that's interesting. I just I was excited to see uh, Buddy Hall, the idea of Buddy Holly at the Rave Eagles because that that particular club um, has a you know a reputation because it's it's old. There's a lot of hidden rooms, you know. They have mm-hmm. th- and um, and it always has the reputation of being mobbed up. Too. Oh really? Oh, yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Even, well, that even, makes it even more interesting. Even even to the present day, I had um, uh, at somewhere I used to work, we were I was having a music discussion, and this one girl sends me an email and says, "Well, let me tell you about the rave." Um, she she goes, "My dad was part of a consortium that was trying to buy it, and the kind of um." organized crime that they you know that w- went on there and that she said that her father had to try to get around to buy it just made it too difficult to, no uh, way. to yeah so i uh i just that idea that yeah buddy holly's you know like the ghost of buddy holly plus the ghost of whoever's under the basement uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah and and the other thing uh when you're writing this book um especially when i was writing about the locations now sometimes the locations aren't connected with the, mu- the musician himself or herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, the uh, First Avenue in uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. I am currently right around four blocks from the First Avenue in Minneapolis. I can Are you see- serious? Oh, wow. That's I can great. See- I can see it from my window right now. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, but, you know, there's a case where... Uh, you know, it's not like the ghost of Prince or the ghost of Husker Du is is uh, <laughs> haunting the place, but there are ghostly legends. So I think in the Rave Eagles, there you don't know who is doing the haunting necessarily in a case like that, because I, I think that was Buddy Holly's one of the last places he played. Yeah, because um, Iowa Iowa was the last night, and then um, okay. I mean, that's only a couple hundred miles away. For, so if they were on tour, that'd be the direction they were going. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I never really had, uh, in, in that case, you have at least the musician saying that he appeared. Uh, but then there were a lot of other kind of miscellaneous haunting stuff that goes on. Uh, and you see that across, across the spectrum, Graceland. Um, you know, there's stories about Elvis haunting Graceland, but there's also, uh, at least one story of his Grand uh, of his mother haunting Graceland too in the oh. attic. Yeah, so that's um, it, it's it's hard to kind of it's not like uh, they introduce themselves when they do any type of weird stuff. It's not like they go, you know, this is Gladys Presley. I'm going to be pushing over this glass here or anything like that. Um, well, that's and, and speaking of haunted locations, so. Mm-hmm. When you looked over the different venues, the haunted studios and concert venues, and you go through Seattle, you talk about Billy Bob Thornton in the cave. And Mm -hmm. uh, we actually brought that one up on a a previous, around Halloween, we did a little bit of Ghosts and Rock Stars. And um, your book was one of the inspirations. That's where we're like, we should probably just call Matt Swain and see if he wants (laughs) to talk. And that was the first thing. Um, so what did you think was one of the most haunted venues when you, or had the most stories? Cause I tend to see, you know, theaters, theaters really have more ghost stories than, uh, than all, any other kinds of place. So what do you think in the country was one of the most haunted ones when you were doing your research that you're like, I can't believe how many stories just come from this one place. 
Well, the the one that stands uh, out for me, and it's not necessarily just connected with uh, haunted rock and roll. In fact, it's connected. I think even Stravinsky, uh, I believe, was one of the artists that performed at the Cincinnati Music Hall. Okay. And it not only had a lot of ghost stories, it had a lot of legitimate witnesses saying that they witnessed kind of weird stuff there. So... As I recall, I think the CEO of the the um, theater association had a paranormal run-in. They had people in the box office claiming they actually saw apparitions. Um, you know, that was the one that, uh, again, it's not intimately connected with rock and roll, but mm-hmm. I think that one is is pretty legit. The other one I think that stands out is uh, Rick Rubin's The Mansion, his... His studio out in California, I think it's in Los Angeles, there was one of the members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, was afraid to uh, stay overnight there and actually commuted back and forth while the rest of the band um, uh, stayed overnight when they were recording uh, an album there. Oh, that's great. And then there was, there was another case where uh, a member of Slipknot... He had some run-ins with, uh, he said the uh, temperature in the room would fluctuate. Uh, somebody, one of the band members felt a uh, spirit pass through them as they they went through, uh, they, they went into the basement of this building. Ah. The, the interesting thing is, I think when you scare a guy who is in a band named Slipknot, <laughs> you've, re- you've really accomplished something. So those are the two venues, I think, that I feel are, are, uh, you know, on paper pretty legitimately haunted. Well, that, that's great. And it's interesting that uh, you mentioned Slipknot. I mean, and I'm looking, when I look to the book, if, if you guys have the book uh, Haunted Rock and Roll, uh, it's chapter 19, The Mansion. And that's where they talk about the Chili Peppers and Slipknot. And um, Corey Taylor, who, who you mentioned uh, in this chapter, uh, he actually wrote a book about his experiences with the paranormal, too. Oh, did he? Yeah, so that's uh, you know, I, I may have I may have come across that when I was researching that. So, um, but uh, it's, it's funny. So that place, and and you mentioned Cincinnati and the Cincinnati Music Hall, and in a in a related story. So, in the band that Wendy and I, uh, who also works on the podcast, in the band that we play in, uh, we often go and play in Cincinnati, and there's a place called the Thompson House. Which is Thompson House. Yeah, and the and the Thompson House um, is the home. It's in Newport, Kentucky, so it's right across the border from uh, Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. And so the Thompson House is the home of the guy that invented the Tommy gun. So oh, wow. it, it's his mansion, and they converted it, and it's a beautiful place, and they converted it into a, a music venue. But people often see weird things happen there, and it's it's kind of like you know in, in the Sarah Winchester and the Winchester House that you know she mm-hmm. said she was haunted by the spirits of the people who were killed with the Winchester. Um, that's one of the reasons that they say that the Thompson House is haunted because it's haunted by the spirits of the people who were killed with the Tommy gun. Yeah, it. And the more I get into this, um, and and I, w- I would like to put together a sequel eventually. The more you know, when I talk to people like you uh, and, and actual musicians, the new names come up all the time and, and new ghost stories kind of pop up. So I'll have to look into that one. Absolutely. And it looks like Cincinnati, if you are into the paranormal and pop culture, uh, Cincinnati is one of the places to be. It, it, absolutely. Cincinnati, Ohio is pretty haunted. Uh, Pennsylvania has its share, not necessarily of rock and roll ghosts, but... Uh, um, it, definitely, the Midwest seems to be the most haunted in a in a rock and roll sense. Well, that that's interesting. Now, Pennsylvania, big state, a lot of big cities. Your home state. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any? Was there a, a favorite venue or a place in Pennsylvania that you think has more ghost stories than anywhere else? I, I know that. I mean, State College, a college town, and I think mm-hmm. about um, Madison, and and I I run a. Uh, a uh, haunted history tour in Madison, Wisconsin, and so okay. uh, any any particular towns or things in uh, Pennsylvania that you think anybody traveling through has to see when it comes to haunts. Well, 
you know, going back to my university ghost story, um, I put together. So what happened was when I was working as a, a newspaper reporter, um, I, I had this idea, you know, I'm born on Halloween, so I better have a good Halloween feature story uh, <laughs> and represent my, my birthday. That's right. And I, I decided one year, I, I'm like, well, I'm just going to write about local ghost legends. So I looked around the area for, for local ghost legends in the Tyrone area, which is where I'm from, which is about 20 miles away from, uh, 20 miles south of uh, Penn State, State College. Mm-hmm. And I found a lot of the typical ghost lore stories. The the classic one was uh, uh, Sylvia, who who haunted the woods, and when teenagers were you know, trying to make out with their girlfriends, they would take them up to the pike, we call it, and and light a match and try to summon this ghost of Sylvia. That's kind of classic folklore. Oh, that's great. So I found a few of those. But what I found was that universities had probably as many ghosts as battlefields or haunted castles or or, or things like that. So Penn State is, I, I think just this year, unofficially was named the number two haunted site in uh, the number two haunted campus in the country, uh, very close to um, the University of Ohio or Ohio University. Cool. So uh, definitely, you know, stop by uh, Penn State and check out some of those places. I don't think I I came across any any musical sites though uh, related to. Um, you know, there were a couple bars and taverns that I uh, that I heard were haunted, but I don't think I included them. So maybe that's another area of uh, you know investigation. Maybe some of those old sites where they used to perform American Bandstand in Philadelphia. Um, so I'll, I'll have to check that out. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, you know what? Who I always think of as the most kind of a cultish, paranormalish, ghostish band, and and you talk about them in chapter six of your book, is probably Led Zeppelin. Yeah, you know, it's just I mean, Jimmy Page buys the house that used to belong to Aleister Crowley. Um, they have songs that have mystical themes, like their the runes on their album covers. Um, you know, and and I've, I've heard so much Led Zeppelin in my life. Uh, cause mm-hmm. the radio stations in Milwaukee and we were growing up, they, they were two hard rock, you know, stations and they would play at least a Led Zeppelin song every hour on either one. Right. So I heard enough Led Zeppelin growing up. I mean, to last me, I can I, I, all by heart, you know, it's like we all know all these songs by heart. But what do you think was the most, um, interesting or, uh, exciting, uh, haunting paranormal slash story about Zepp that, uh, you know, that you've heard? Well, you know, if we're going to talk about haunted locations in rock and roll history, number one for me uh, is the Bulliskin House. And uh, you mentioned it, the mansion on Loch Ness, where uh, uh, Aleister Crowley originally uh, bought the house. Um, Even probably the reason why he bought it was because it had this, even at that time, a length, and he was, you know, Victorian era uh, guy. uh, Mm -hmm. They used to call him the Antichrist, in case uh, people don't know. But oh, we've we've talked about uh, okay. Uncle Alistair on the on the podcast a whole bunch. He's he's a lot. Okay. I I even went searching for that house when I went to Loch Ness. I couldn't find. Oh, it. did you? But um, yeah. Well, but well, pl- it had quite continue. an extensive uh, haunted history. There was one story that um, there was at least one story that uh, there was a church on the property that burned down, killing all the congregants. Uh, there was another story that uh, someone was beheaded um, in in the house, and uh, so when Crowley took it over, took it over, the the legends only increased. And you know, the, the funny thing is, like most realtors would never tell you that your house, you know, the house that you wanted to buy is haunted. I can imagine how easy the job would be uh, if you had Jimmy Page <laughs> as one of your clients. Yes. Uh, you know, he's going to actually want to be in a haunted house. And, you know, he acquired Bolleskin House. And the the stories there, I think, are some of the most fascinating in the book. 
and they are the ones that really strike uh, kind of a, you know, to be honest with you, they were, I was creeped out when I was writing them. There's okay. one that there was a party. I don't know whether Jimmy Page was there, um, but uh, some of his friends were there and they witnessed a painting uh, come up off of the wall and not fall, but levitate down to the floor. Awesome. And that was, that was probably one of the cool stories. Now, you know, I, uh, I immediately think, well, maybe they're, you know, I'm kind of always, I, I have a real devil's advocate uh, point of view. And I, I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe they were higher stoned, but right. what. It was the 70s. What, yeah, it was the 70s, and this was Led Zap. Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. But in a Rolling Stone interview, um, Jimmy Page told the reporter that one of his friends who was. A uh, sober, straight guy was staying overnight when he wasn't there. Uh, he told uh, the caretaker the next morning that he he wants the caretaker to make sure the cats are out at night because they were rolling around in the hall and it was you know keeping them up. And that's when the the caretaker said, "Well, they were outside, and probably what you heard was," and then started to tell him the story about uh, how how uh, there was a, a man that was beheaded and that some uh. people could hear this head roll down the hall. And that's what he heard. And, you know, of course the reporter asked Jimmy Page, well, you know, uh, uh, well, I guess Jimmy Page told the reporter that, sh- that he never heard it. And so the reporter said, well, you don't believe it's haunted. And then Jimmy Page kind of cryptically says, I, I didn't say that. I just said that I never heard the head roll down the hall. So mm. who knows what he saw? Well, that's in that bowl of skin house and, and Jimmy Page and all their, uh, the mystical stuff, you know, so that's mm-hmm. a, that's a great, that's a great, that's in chapter six of the book. Um, so that's a great chapter for anybody who definitely wants to check it out. Now, did you, um, if you had a chance to, uh, to interview anybody or, uh, you know, who had had any of these experiences for the book. I was just wondering if there, if there was anyone you talked to that um, you found particularly believable or any one of the stories that when you investigated it more than others, you were like, well, this one seems to have more weight than some of the other stories in the book. Um, I didn't actually talk to the folks involved at... Uh um, Mama Cass's house. But that one, to me, uh, seems to be a little bit more believable than other ones, only because, again, it, it, you kind of have to approach these things just like a reporter who you analyze the sources and try to determine their credibility. And um, Mama Cass's house in L.A., the mansion, not, it's not where she died, but where she lived and apparently really had a great affinity for that house. Um, over the years, there were stories that it was haunted. And two people that have come forward publicly to talk about it, one's Dan Aykroyd and the other is the actress Beverly D'Angelo. And they both tell stories. Um, and the, when these accounts came, according to my research, there were years separating them. Um, but uh, Dan Aykroyd claims, it, it, and again, you have to, Dan Aykroyd's a funny guy. And, and <laughs> right. is, you know, so when I'm writing this, I'm thinking, is he trying to put me on? Because he says things like uh, the exercise bike turned on by itself. Well, is he making kind of a slam at Mama Cass's uh, weight problem uh, or not? Sure. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but he does mention uh, in his account that jewelry on the uh, on the, the dresser would move by itself, and he would see this, and, and probably his wife uh, Donna Donna Dixon probably saw the same thing. Beverly D'Angelo years later tells a, a so similar story. Uh, this I think she she said it on um, Celebrity Ghost Stories that reminded me of Dan Aykroyd's that she was uh, sleeping one night. She woke up. She heard this kind of metallic growl of um, material going across the tabletop and she looked up and she actually saw the jewelry moving on this this table or or, uh, mantle. So to me, you have two people witnessing the same thing uh, years apart 
uh, to me, that's that's a pretty legitimate ghost story. Um, so that's that's definitely one. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones. You know, there are places. One of the the uh, haunted locales that I looked into was Ernstine and Hazel's, and I talked to a paranormal investigator there who, you know, is is uh, really believable and and has claimed to to have quite a bit of evidence, you know, on a paranormal nature. It this is a place where which would be ripe for um, would be ripe for uh, ghost lore because it was an old uh, bar up on, t- there was a bar and then there was a kind of a little general store. And then apparently on the top floor, there were, a, there was a prostitution, uh, a house of prostitutes and one of the, the prostitutes committed suicide there. Okay. So that has all the, the kind of the ingredients for a good ghost lore story. Well, I, I, I really do think that, um, the Dan Aykroyd one and Beverly D'Angelo that if you guys don't, everybody knows Dan Aykroyd if you're listening to this podcast, probably because you've all seen Ghostbusters. If mm-hmm. Beverly D'Angelo is the wife in National Lampoon's Vacation, yeah. So that's just if you're wondering if it, you need if you need the picture in the mind. We're talking uh, we're talking right after the uh, week of Christmas here. So if you watched Christmas Vacation over the weekend, then you probably saw Beverly D'Angelo. Yes, and the other thing about Dan Aykroyd is he has quite a, a background in. Uh, paranormal research. His grandfather, I think, was very big in the Psychical Society in Canada. Uh, he talks in the interview that I read about it be- being very common for him to be in his house and um, seeing tracks and, and magazines and journals from uh, psychical research, okay. which is sort of what we now call paranormal research. So he really, he really kind of respects it and. Uh, his brother wrote an incredible history of of, of uh, paranormal research. So, I I don't know whether he was joking at all on all of the the material. Yeah, it it seems that Dan. I mean, Dan Aykroyd does have a he's got a relationship with the paranormal. Um, he loves it. Uh, he used to host a show called Sci Factor, which was mm-hmm. um, you know they said they were based on true stories, but you know, uh, but either I mean, so it does it does feel like that wouldn't be something that he would joke about just to get a little press or something because he's more interested in the serious side than he right. is in just uh, being wacky, right? Um, so you know, look, you have so many great ghost stories in the book and everything, and uh, one of one of the I think your last chapter, and this is something I'm I'm interested in. Um, because we, t- we had an episode on the 27 Club. Yeah, I, I, I listened in. Oh, right, right on, right on. So you know a little bit of what we were talking about, but something, yeah. something that you got into that um, I don't know too much about, and so I'm really interested, is the, if, tw- if your chapter, if 27 turned out to be 9, mm-hmm. numerology, rock and roll, and the 27 Club. So right. for, for those of us who aren't well-versed in that kind of thing, I was wondering if you could just go a little bit into that, because I think that's a the numerology part is a real interesting thing that we didn't consider before. Sure. And, and, and this really, you know, I don't know whether I, I overreached in this theory, um, but, but what it was born of is that I study, you know, I was researching the 27 Club, and, and Gary Patterson did a great uh, job on that. Mm-hmm. And um, there were also some things in his book where he did talk about numerology. Um, and, and as I was researching it, I came across a study that uh, from an English researcher, I think, who analyzed uh, the 27 Club and, and came up with the conclusion that it was just a coincidence that someone who, a rock star who was 27, wasn't any more likely to die at 27 than anybody else. But then, because I, what I do during my day job is I'm a you know a science and research writer for Penn State, so sure. I can kind of look at research papers and, and try to figure them out. So I actually looked at the paper and found a couple things that that stood out. One, and just to give you an idea, at this point I'm ready to write the chapter off and say it's just coincidence. Right. And there's but, al- there's uh, already plenty of stories in the book, you know, and, and it's coming right at the very end. So I can see where you're like, well, should we go into this or not? Right. Right. And, and I I was probably going to throw it out, but then a couple things just to, that these researchers did is one of the things that I noticed was they started their what they were looking at was the 
people who were in uh, had a number one single in the UK um, from 1950 to I don't know maybe 1978 79. Uh, and a couple of things stood out for me that most people wouldn't notice, but if you were you know interested in rock history, you would. Mm-hmm. 1950 to 1956, there probably wasn't. That that wasn't even the start of the rock era. Right. The rock era pretty much starts 56, 57. So even years after that, in the UK, it was unlikely that any of the American rockers were going to get to the top one position, mainly because the UK had quite a bit of censorship with uh, the, the music scene there. So you, right away, you're going to you're going to cut off a large group of the rock era. Uh, so the other thing you notice is uh, people like Janis Joplin and I think Jim Morrison, uh, two um, members of the 27 Club, were not included in that because I don't think they ever had a number one in the UK. They might have had a number 15 or a, you know a seven, but never a number one. Sure, and that, so, that's a big. I mean, and those are the two of the big ones, uh, and you know right away. Right. So the, it seemed to be cherry picked data. So then I started thinking, okay, well, maybe it's not coincidence, but what the heck would it be? Because, you know, you have to look at that list of, of people uh, and think it's more than coincidence. So one of the right. ideas that was kind of discussed and mentioned was the idea of uh, numerology and the special uh, way to approach numbers and that numbers are symbolic. And so I looked at the number 27 itself and if you add up two and seven in that number, you get nine. And then some schools of numerology suggest that that's the number of the artist uh, or the magician or the shaman. So uh, that seemed to, to make sense to me. So that's why I really put that part in. Again, I look at this as... as uh, you know, I didn't know whether I overreached on that. I don't mm-hmm. know whether there's something to this, but it seemed to be a little more coincidental than than what I I first initially supposed. Well, I think when, uh, you're, when you're when we're already talking about uh, you know the go the ghosts of famous rock stars, mm-hmm. um, I think moving a little bit into adding some numbers together to have meaning. I don't know if that's a stretch. You know, and I've had other people tell me that they kind of. Uh, wanted to know the, the, that themselves. They always wanted to know what was so special about 27. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have people like Amy Winehouse, who died at 27, and Kurt Cobain at 27. Uh, some people tell me, well, you know, 27 is that era that, you know, the, the drugs and alcohol are really going to take their toll. Well, I counter that I'm surprised Amy Winehouse made it to 27. Right, she's partied hard. Yeah, I mean, some of these stories of these rockers, they had been, you know, on the edge from, you know, 18 to maybe even earlier than that, the mm-hmm. 27. So, uh, it's, it's a, it's, to me, it's, it's a real mystery. And, well, I just, you know, what I like when you, when you get into it, um, you know, not just the age 27 and, and, and also, I mean, this is the height of their fame when you're talking about too. I mean, mm-hmm. Amy Winehouse was about to get ready to do, you know, the the single for the James Bond film. That's right. Kurt Cobain was coming. I mean, they were coming off their second major label album. Like, they hadn't even gotten mm-hmm. to the, the – I mean, the th- it's usually a third album is when bands have a headlining tour and stuff like that. And, and they were just getting to the apex of their right. of their fame, you know, when they died. And if it's something about – that particular, you know, the apex of their fame and their ages and then the, you know, maybe the the apex of their drug abuse too. I mean, one of the things they talk about in that study that you mentioned is that uh, heroin over, the treatment for heroin overdoses has gotten a lot better since the 1970s. Mm-hmm. That's and true. So that in, in this, you know, if you if you stick a needle in your arm now and you take too much, the chances of surviving now are a lot better than they were in, you know, 1971 and 1960, right. you know, when these things happen to these guys. That's a great point. The, the other thing that comes up every time you talk about the 27 Club is its connection with one of my favorite pieces of the book, uh, at least researching and writing about, is 
Robert Johnson, the, the you know the blues man, the from, original uh, rock the star. Delta. He was the original rock star, and you know depending on what uh, birth date they used for him, and, and records weren't as good as they are now. He was 27 when he died, and they would probably say that he was 27 when the devil came to, to collect payment of his soul. Right. So. You know, you can kind of worm that way into the the whole argument or the whole debate of what is behind the 27 Club. You mentioned all these artists were really at kind of, uh, you know, celebrity highs uh, and creative highs. When you think about Jimi Hendrix, he was really at a position where he was going to move on to kind of like more jazz, more... He was going to move away from... Uh, the, the kind of standard hard rock that he was doing, mm-hmm. and he had moved on with bands of Gypsy. It, is there something about that time in the artist's life uh, that I, I don't know? So no, that, there's a lot of speculation. That's an excellent point. I mean, you, you know, you think about. Uh, I mean, Jim Morrison too was in. You know, he was in Paris at the time, living. You know, yep. he'd already he'd already left. I mean, Kurt Cobain was interested. And, uh, I mean, he didn't like fame or any of that business. I mean, so, you know, whether he was interested in keeping the band going or not, you know, mm-hmm. if some, if it was also something where, well, maybe these people, um, you know, they'd achieved something awesome in their particular field. And as they were planning to leave that field and change, you know, mm-hmm. is that, that's something that might have to something sinister that might have to do with it as well. That you're gonna you're gonna be doing this not only for the rest of your life but for forever. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool uh, that I, I I find about the Crossroads legend, which is that um, artists will go to the Crossroads and sell their soul to the devil, and then they'll get so many years of fame, but then the devil takes his you know comes to, uh, for payment with the soul. Collect. So, but but what you really have there in the nutshell is is definitely the artist's journey and certainly the rock artist's journey, which is, you know, some people ask me why is rock and roll so haunted? And I think it's because rock and roll is traditionally an outsider's art. It's done on the outside, on the fringes of society, whether it's, you know, a blues guy down in the Delta or whether it's a kid out in the you know, ghettos of Memphis or uh, a bunch of working class uh, scruffs in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. They come from the outside of society and they give this art. And, and in a lot of cases, like Robert Johnson, they, they are isolated from the mainstream. They come into the mainstream. They have this art that they pretty much give away. Uh, and then the next thing you know, they're celebrities. They're making a lot of money. They have all the wine, women, and fame you could ask for, and then they realize, you know, they've sold their soul, that 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 art that they created is now a commodity. And, you know, this is kind of a process that you see in the 27 Club of all of the journey of all of these artists from, you know, really hard scrabble roots into the mainstream, kind of gets into the machine, and then they want to get out. Uh, and the 27 Club is very much uh, in line with that journey of the rock artist. And, and I think that's a, um, you know, it's it's not just the behind the music story, you mm-hmm. know, that uh, we always we always see that. I mean, these things have been happening for the past. You know, Robert Johnson died 80 years yeah. ago. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> there are there are other stories even before this of artists that I, I did not know until after the book was written that, uh, you know, artists from the 1800s and 1700s, uh, I know I'm going to botch the name, but, uh, the violinist Paganini, oh, yeah. I think his name is, mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of this devil crossroads things that, um, you know, so it goes, it goes way back. And uh, no, it's it's a story through time, and you know why why is rock and roll so haunted? And it's the outsiders, it's the it's the artist journey, and it's the a life ending without everyone, um, without without finishing what they had to say. And what better way to create a ghost story? You know, if you talk to most of your ghost story, that's a theme of an unfinished life. 
So when you think about the ghost stories of Kurt Cobain, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, I didn't find any on Jim, Jimi Hendrix, but I wish there were. Uh, but uh, Elvis Presley, even, you know, there's this idea of of uh, they they didn't put their final, you know, kind of etch out there, uh, their final mark. And you know, you see a lot of other ghost stories outside of the rock and roll realm that have similar themes. So it's all kind of connected. Absolutely, absolutely. And so we have a link. We're gonna have a link in the show notes for anybody who wants to pick up. Their copy of Haunted Rock and Roll, Ghostly Tales of Musical Legends. Uh, I recommend it. It's a great book, and it's going to make you the smartest of all your friends when it comes to bar time conversation or when you hear a, you're going to hear a song on the radio and you're going to be like, hey, guys, and have a, have a story for them right away. And, Matt, we're going to have to get you back to tell more stories and also to talk haunted universities when they have that. Um, but where can people find you and more information about your books and your uh, authorship and things like that? The best place that you can reach me is I have a Facebook site, uh, Haunted Rock and Roll. Uh, maybe you can put a link up there, too, with Absolutely. that. Um, that's usually the best way to get a hold of me uh, and to check things out. Um, I love writing books. I love researching and uh, the material for the books. I'm not the greatest at marketing them, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> uh, but that's usually the best way to do it. Fantastic. So make sure you guys check out Matt's site. And today's original Sunspot track is a sad song about lovers separated by the grave. See if you can figure out who this one's about. This song is called Forever in the Snow. for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at OthersidePodcast.com. Until next time.
See you on the other side.